والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم مثل الذين ينفقون اموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبه انبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, peace and Allah's mercy be upon you, and welcome to Universal Quran. Alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah alone, wa salat wa salam ala rasulillah, and his blessings and peace upon the Prophet and Messenger Muhammad. In Universal Quran, we study the Islamic scripture and its explanation and interpretation in the science of tafsir. The Qur'an is a universal message for all of humanity. But to understand it correctly, we have to be aware of the principles of interpreting a sacred scripture from a past uh, time, from a, a, from a past generation. We have to understand the language in which it was revealed, the circumstances and the history behind that revelation, and how it was applied in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself and his companions and the early generation. The Quran isn't simply a book of theory. It's a book about beliefs and practices and it's meant to be implemented in all aspects of life. And the best guide to implementing it in our lives is looking at the interpretation of the Prophet himself as well as his early companions and those people who followed after them. And by taking them as our example, we can be assured of, inshallah, fully understanding the religion of Islam and that we are following it the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended us to follow. Now, we're currently reading from the 29th section, Juz Tabarak, the next to last part of the Holy Quran. And we are currently on chapter 68, Al Qalam. Now, this and a lot of the other chapters in this section of the Holy Quran were revealed in Mecca, in the earlier part of Islamic history, in the early stage of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Muslims were a minority and they were enduring a great amount of persecution. Uh, you can tell these chapters because they focus on certain themes, talking to the idolaters, the people of Mecca who worshipped idols, telling them about the oneness of Allah, that they should worship the one creator of the universe and not worship other beings whom they took to be their mediators between them and God. And to believe in life after death, that there is going to be a judgment and that we will be held accountable. These two major beliefs are the bedrock of Islam and that is what allows us after that to distinguish between good and evil, knowing that we will be responsible before our one creator on the day of judgment, that our actions will be, uh, we will be held to account for our actions. Uh, in the previous verses that we have uh, read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was uh, talking about the great high level of the Prophet's character, his ethical and moral standards being of the highest character, that he is the best example for us of a person who exemplifies the message of Islam in words as well as in deeds. Now we're going to continue, we're going to be reading from uh, starting from verse 9, about people who rejected the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and indeed their characteristics, their ethics and morals were the almost completely the opposite of the Prophet's behavior. Um, to read for us, we have uh, Sheikh Brother Adil, who is a reciter of the Holy Quran in the Arabic text. Uh, and uh, we have our brother um, Tahseen, who reads the English interpretation of the meanings of the Qur'an, and then we will discuss some of the aspects of the tafsir or interpretation of those verses. So, Adil, if you could read, please, from verse 9 through 16. Sure. 
إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين فلا تطع المكذبين ودوا لو تدهن فيدهنون ولا تطع كل حلاف مهين هماز مشاء بنميم مناع للخير معتد أثيم عتل بعد ذلك زنيم أن كان ذا مال وبنين إذا تتلى عليه آياتنا قال أساطير الأولين سنسمه على الخرطوم Thank you. Barely, your Lord knows better who has gone astray from his path, and he knows better those who are guided. So obey not the deniers. They wish that you should compromise with them so that they would compromise with you. And obey not everyone who swears much and is considered worthless, a slanderer, going about with calumnies, hinderer of the good, transgressor, sinful, cruel, after all that base born. Because he had wealth and children, when our verses are recited to him, he says, tales of the men of old. We shall brand him over the nose. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and to the Muslims in general who were living in Mecca at that time, that who were enduring persecution at the hands of the leaders of Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad, who were the leaders of the Arabs and of Mecca, to be patient that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who is sincere in following the path, who is a believer in the Holy Quran and a follower of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and who is not sincere. And do not obey them, do not allow them to influence you. Because they were leaders who were powerful and they used threats and they used intimidation, people sought to do things to please them. And that is the characteristic of people in every time and place. That the leaders of any society are able to uh, uh, hold out their power over people and influence them and people have a tendency to follow them, not because they are the ones who know best or they are the wisest or the best leaders, but because they are the people who are in power. And so Allah was exhorting the Muslims at that time, but also Muslims in any time who are living in difficult circumstances in a society to be patient and steadfast, not to give up just because you're uh, outnumbered and because people are, are uh, uh, calling all kinds of names to people who are following Islam and threatening Muslims and, and imprisoning them or torturing them. But be patient. Eventually, in this life, or in the hereafter, the truth will be known, and those people who were on the true path will find satisfaction, and they will be given to know, they will be pleased with their reward in heaven, and those people who have fought Islam and have fought against Allah's message will have their punishment in hellfire. In verse 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they would wish that you would compromise with them so they could compromise with you. And this is also a particular case at that time, but it's a universal circumstance that Muslims have faced in all kinds of different cultures and in situations that were much different than the people of Mecca. They worshipped idols. The idols which they worshipped were representations of holy people of the past, of angels and jinn and spirits. And they believed that those people could mediate between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran clearly told them, to worship the Creator alone and to worship nothing else beside Him. So they told the Prophet ﷺ, you pray to our idols for one year and then we will follow your religion for one year. And that's kind of a, a ridiculous joke to them because of course they knew very well that if Islam was true, then there's no way that Muslims could pray to those idols. By doing so, they were giving up the essence of their faith. There's no way that Muslims could compromise on an issue like praying to a statue or a human-made symbol as a representation of a being other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who cannot be represented in any form. And so there's no possibility of compromising on an issue like do I worship one God or do I worship 
uh, numerous beings? Or do I worship Allah alone? Or do I worship pictures and images of God or images of any divine being so-called or any uh, creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is a very important for us to know in da'wah or in conveying the message of Islam to people. That sometimes we're asked to make compromises which Muslims are not able to do. I remember one time I attended a lecture of a well-known Orientalist, a person who was a specialist in Islam in the West, and had as much knowledge of, of Islam as probably most people, even most Muslims. And he was asked by somebody in the audience, uh, what, what can be done so that Muslims can get along with all other people? And he said there's only one problem between, that if we could solve this one problem, then Muslims could get along with everybody. Of course, he's not a Muslim, but he's uh, an expert on Islam. And he said, the only problem is that Muslims have to accept that you can worship God through plastic symbols, by which he meant statues or pictures made of by hand. So if Muslims would only accept that idolatry is, is all right, then they would get along with everybody else. That was his solution. So that showed that despite all of his information about Islam, he didn't even understand what the essence of Islam is, which is the oneness of Allah and the impossibility of, of, of encapsulating Allah's divinity in any symbol and then worshipping that. But all of that is called idolatry. And so Muslims, for the sake of da'wah, can speak to people of other religions and go to them in their places and talk to them. But they can't join in to the worship, in join in a worship service, worshipping other beings or worshipping in a way which was not commanded in the Qur'an or in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But they should go to speak to people in their places, their churches or synagogues or homes or businesses, and tell them about the message of Islam, and tell them that you know Muslims worship the one God that you believe in, and we do not compromise on the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as given to us by the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And so the Muslims were being told through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa not to compromise, not to compromise on the essential aspects of the faith, that as soon as you were to do such a thing, you would be denying Islam completely, by worshipping an idol, even if you thought that would be a way of getting them to your religion, by worshipping along with them. And that's what people think today. If I do things or say things that will be pleasing to them, then they'll want to join Islam. But actually, they would respect Islam only if it was important enough that you wouldn't compromise it, and you would not worship their other gods, or worship in a way which was not true to the teachings of your religion. So the Prophet ﷺ was warned, not to obey some of these people, meaning don't follow them, do not allow them to influence you or to influence your course of action, but follow the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not follow every oath-taking person who is a liar, a person who is always in violent arguments and inappropriate times. He has to constantly swear all the time in an inappropriate way because he's always lying and he's always making up things. And so the people who are frequent oath takers, I swear this, I swear that, are usually the people who are not telling the truth. But a person who is true reflects the truth in his behavior, in his adherence to the principles of Islam uh, by not lying, not cheating, and, and always speaking uh, correctly. And that becomes something apparent from his behavior. While the person who has to always swear they're telling the truth is most likely uh, not. But it's because these people had false beliefs and a lack of intelligence that they believed that they could uh, confuse the Muslims by their oaths, uh, calling them to worship these idols, and then therefore, if they, if the Muslims would do what they wanted, then they would join in and worship along with the Muslims and become Muslims. And that was just part of their, of their uh, uh, trying to trick the Muslims in their beliefs and practices. Um, we're going to uh, break and go for a break for a few minutes, and we'll be back. We will complete uh, some more verses from chapter 68 of Qalam. يهدي به الله من اتبع رضوانه The Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Most High spoke the Quran. It's the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we given the rights of the Quran? Are you ready to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment? for the Qur'an to take us from our hands to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we go through every verse in the Qur'an to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? Watch Huda TV, Qur'an in depth.
Welcome back to Universal Quran. We're reading from chapter 68, Al-Qalam. Uh, we're reading right now from uh, the verses 11 through 16, which we had recited just before the break, uh, describing those leaders of the enemies of Islam in Mecca in those early days. Not one particular leader necessarily, but uh, the general characteristics of many of those people, some of whom were closely related to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam himself. Uh, exactly the opposite of the Prophet's characteristics which were described in earlier verses as being the highest level of moral, ethical behavior. Uh, a person who spreads slander, who utters falsehoods about people, who tries to spread rumors and cause people to hate each other and divide the community. This was a characteristic of those people, but it's also a common characteristic that we find within our own Muslim communities today. People who spread rumors and backbiting and gossip about people, and it causes uh, people to divide and hate each other, and it weakens the whole community. The Prophet uh, was passing by uh, some graves, and he said there are people in these two graves are being punished in, within the grave. And this is an aspect of Islamic belief that you can be punished for your sins in the grave. But he said they're not being punished for a major sin, but for actually what would seem to us to be minor sins. He said one of them would not be careful about uh, guard against urine. So he would have unclean substances from using the toilet spilled on his clothing. He would be careless about it and then he would go and pray. And so because of his careless attitude, uh, in his, his worship was not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was being punished in the grave. And the other one was one who spread namima or backbiting, uh, saying evil things and lies about people behind their backs. This is an authentic hadith found in Bukhari and Muslim, the two most authentic sources of the Prophet's hadith. And there's another authentic hadith that the slanderer, a frequent slanderer, cannot enter paradise. So it's a very, very grave warning to Muslims of dividing the community through the evils of the tongue and spreading uh, false information about people. A hinderer of good, a transgressor, a transgressor, a sinful person who doesn't pay what he owes to people, who doesn't pay charity, who withholds the good that he has from others, but is stingy and tight with his rizq, which he received from Allah, his provision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So withholds it from his own family or relatives or doesn't give it to those people who are in need of his charity or zakat. And mu'tad means a person who's extravagant in their consumption, even of halal, even of what is permitted, but is excessive and overindulgent and therefore uh, eats more or, or spends more than he needs and more than, than anybody in his level of society would need or care for, and yet is stingy with other people. And then the sinful person, Athim, the one who consumes what is forbidden by Allah because it is unhealthy and is, is harmful to the human health and therefore has been forbidden, but consumes that as food or as wealth and, or, or by taking that which is, belongs to others by stealing or cheating other people. A cruel... And even after being cruel, a base-born person. This word, atul here, which is being discussed, is a crude, rude, violent person. An overeating, over-drinking, over-sexed kind of person. The exact opposite of the Prophet Wasallam, who did everything in moderation, with kindness, who was always balanced in his treatment of people, always moderate in his um, eating and drinking. A zanim, a person who is well known for his base character, a person who is obvious, just like a, a well known to the people, he has a bad reputation, everybody in the society already knows this person's behavior, who can be easily distinguished between, between his characteristics and the people of faith, the people who, who are righteous and have a good behavior, as well as a person who pretends to be related to those whom he's not, pretends to have a lineage which he doesn't. So in fact, he knew that he wasn't uh, a legitimate son of his father, but was actually illegitimate, but pretends to be related to that person. So these verses are talking about the complete contrast of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, a person who doesn't have the high lineage he pretends to have, and it shows in his character, and he's well known to people. But why do people listen to people like this? Why do they listen to vulgar, disgusting, uh, obnoxious people? Because the, they're saying things that they want to hear rather than listening to the truth from a person whom you respect and who is clearly uh, of high moral character because sometimes the truth is hard and difficult to follow. And he did this because 
he had wealth and children. But in spite of that, in spite of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him greatly with wealth and children, he rejected the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When our revelations are recited, he says, tales of the men of old, the tales of the ancients, just like people say today. Oh, those are old, old tales, old stories, mythology from a thousand years ago. Why should we follow it? Not because the message isn't true, but simply because it's old, then it's supposed to be rejected. Not because it's uh, not clearly a message calling to the highest of moral integrity in our behavior. And so Allah SWT says, we will brand him on the nose or on the snout, maybe as a better term for the Arabic term. Ibn Jarir at tabri one of the early commentators uh, or Mufassirin in the science of interpretation of the Quran, said that means that he will make this matter clear and obvious to people. Nobody will be confused. In this life, a normal, intelligent person, when they see a person of base, low, low character, should not take information from that person, should not be guided, should not follow him. It should be obvious to follow those people of high standard of character. But because people are fooled by people, they're confused and they don't use their intelligence. But on the Day of Judgment, their faces will be darkened, these wicked people, and nobody will be confused between the people who are following the light of Allah and the people who are left in the darkness. Let's read verses 17 through 25, please. <coughs> إِنَّا بَلَوْنَاهُمْ كَمَا بَلَوْنَا أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ إِذْ أَقْسَمُوا لَيَصْرِمُنَّهَا مُصْبِحِينَ وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ فَطَافَ عَلَيْهَا طَائِفٌ مِّن رَبِّكَ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ فَأَصْبَحَتْ كَالصَّرِيمِ فَتَنَادَوْا مُصْبِحِينَ أن اغدوا على حرثكم إن كنتم صارمين فانطلقوا وهم يتخافتون ألا يدخلنها اليوم عليكم مسكين وغدوا على حرد قادرين Thank you. Verily we have tried them as we tried the people of the garden, when they swore to pluck the fruits in the morning, without saying, if Allah will. <clears throat> then there passed on the garden something from your Lord at night, and burnt it while they were asleep. So it became black by the morning, like a pitch dark night. When they called out to one another, as soon as the morning broke, saying, Go to your tilth in the morning, if you would pluck the fruits. So they departed, conversing in secret low tones, saying, No poor man shall enter upon you <clears throat> into it today. Into it today. And when they went in the morning with strong intention, thinking that they have power. Yes, thank you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the unbelievers who are rejecting this message that they're being tried and tested by the coming of this message, and he's giving an example to them that they know very well. And this is an example of the story of a people who had a great garden or a great beautiful garden given to them, which was inherited by their father in Yemen in ancient times. And this story was well known among people and circulated, and it's being given here uh, by, the, by the Quran as an example to the people of Mecca and anybody who questions and doubts this message. They were given a beautiful garden full of every kind of fruit, every kind of, of, of vegetation. They inherited it from their father. And their father was a very pious person from Ahl Kitab, from the persons who believed in the scripture before us, before Islam came, before the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Their father used to, when harvest time came, harvest the beautiful fruits of this garden and store up everything he needed for his family for one year, all the provision they would need for them and their servants and everybody in their household, for guests who came, for anybody who came, this garden produced everything they needed and plenty more. And what was left over, he would give in charity to people. So everybody knew that when it was time for harvest, they would come out and wait for him that day. And in the end, after he had harvested what he needed, they could take what they needed for themselves. And so he was a very kind man. And it was a great blessing that his sons inherited this garden. 
But after he died, they said, our father is a fool. He's an idiot. We would have so much more if we kept it all to ourselves. If we just kept all of Allah's provision to ourselves and we didn't share it with anybody, we would have more. Why should we share our, our blessings with anybody else? And so this is, these verses are telling their story. That they said, we're going to go tomorrow. We're not going to tell anybody. We're going to go out at dark and harvest and not tell anybody so that nobody will be able to harvest these beautiful fruits and the wonderful uh, produce of our garden. So they kept everything secretly, talking quietly, said, without saying, inshallah, God willing. Uh, they said, no, pers- no poor person is going to enter today. No, we're not going to share with anybody. But we're going to harvest everything for ourselves, thinking that they're strong and they're powerful and very wealthy and very successful. Let's go on to the remaining verses, 26 through 33, please. فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهَا قَالُوا إِنَّا لَضَالُّونَ بَلْ نَحْنُ مَحْرُومُونَ قَالَ أَوْسَطُهُمْ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ لَوْلَا تُسَبِّحُونَ قَالُوا سُبْحَانَ رَبِّنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ فأقبل بعضهم على بعض يتلاومون قالوا يا ويلنا إنا كنا طاغين عسى ربنا أن يبدلنا خيرا منها إنا إلى ربنا راغبون كذلك العذاب وَلَعَذَابُ الْآخِرَةِ أَكْبَرُ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ But when they saw the garden, <clears throat> they said, Verily we have gone astray. Then they said, Nay, indeed, indeed we are provided, we are deprived of the fruits. The best, the best among them said, Did I not tell you? Why do you not say, if Allah will? <clears throat> they said, Glory be to our Lord. Verily, we have been wrongdoers. Then they turned one against another in blaming. They said, Woe to us. Verily, we were transgressors. We hope that our Lord will give us in exchange a better garden than this. Truly, we turn to our Lord. Such is the punishment. But truly, the punishment of the hereafter is greater. If they but knew. Thank you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is the punishment of people who, who are withhold the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They came in the morning and found their garden had been destroyed at night. Everything was burnt. Everything was destroyed. And nothing was left. And they said, Glory be to our Lord. We have been wrongdoers. And they turned against each other because everything they had had is lost. They went thinking they were wealthy and powerful and found out they were weak and had nothing left. Woe to us. The best among them said, Hadn't I told you that you should glorify your Lord and you should, you should seek to do things with the permission and will of Allah alone? But this is the punishment of this life. What about the punishment of the hereafter? These people repented and they said, Woe to us, we have been transgressors. They returned to their Lord. Uh, we hope that our Lord will grant us something better in this life or in the hereafter in paradise. But... We have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it's too late. Even if we don't punish and suffer the same punishment that these people did in this world, we will in the hereafter if we reject Islam. That's all we have time for today. And thank you very much for joining us. And I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide us to this message. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وَتَرَى الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدَةً وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ صُنْعَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ إِنَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَفْعَلُونَ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ وكل في فلك يسبحون